Merci mille fois. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming here. Thank you for the invitation. I'm a philosopher, and philosophers deal with concepts. No? So poor of you, you will have to <laughs> do a little trip with me uh, across, uh, let's say, Western concepts. But finally, I tried to propose a new concept which might be helpful for conceiving uh, philosophical, aesthetical thinkings and our attitude towards the world in a different way. So I start. Decolonizing Western philosophy and aesthetics by concepts of disindividuation. Thanks to increased postcolonial awareness, Western philosophies of art and aesthetics now recognize themselves as conditioned by historical anthropologies of the person, by philosophical elaborations on human individuality and specific assumptions on the creation and reception of singled out works of art. Post-colonial critique, while being aware that colonialism is not post, is not over, next intends to initiate an endeavor to incorporate non-Western perspectives and to enrich the range of concepts in order to integrate different views. In a first step, it aims to recognize that the academic discipline of philosophy and aesthetics was developed in the European Enlightenment of the 18th century as a result of specific cultural parameters, including the establishment of public universities and museums, of assumptions of the autonomy of the person and the artwork, and so forth. It criticizes prejudicial differentiations of persons accompanied by theories of race. And it proposes new concepts for a more encompassing and less violent conception of the human existence in the world. Point one, epistemic imperialism. It became obvious that the discipline of aesthetics in the judgment of Immanuel Kant rests on Euro-specific assumptions relating to graphical beauty and technical mastery based on the historical development of aesthetic proportions and on ideas of their optimal presentation and reception forms. The fact that Western artworks were separated from ordinary life and displaced in sacred or secular spaces of protection is part of the West's compart mentalization of sounds of rationality and sensitivity of an artwork's single contemplation by detached persons and its commodification. It comes as no surprise that these aesthetic parameters were criticized today by theorists of the global south using the terms epistemic imperialism or cognitive empire Certain theories from Africa demand a decolonization of mind and inclusion of contribution of others and non-Western-oriented discussions on the understanding of artifacts. The current proposal to decolonize philosophy and aesthetics doesn't just refer to the historical moment of Western European colonization in the late 19th <coughs> century and the scramble for Africa. It extends to the philosophical and aesthetic self-understanding of the global north and to its epistemic fundament. Rereading German philosophers, the Nigerian philosopher Emanuel Esse discovers the fact that for Hegel, colonialism seemed to be a benefit to Africa because Europe inseminated it with reason ethic, culture, and mores, and thereby historicized it. I quote Esse, Hegel does not raise any ethical questions. He declared the African subhuman. It is for good reason that the critique of Eurocentrism has become a significant moment in the practice of African philosophy. Esse questions the relation between the European claim to universality and the fact that the ideals of European modernity have been separated up to now from their historical implementation. 
since Europeans originally introduced the notion of difference in kind between themselves and Africans as a way of justifying unspeakable exploitation and denigration of Africans, the question of the anthropos of the human being has to be connected today with new epistemological and ethical parameters. In this regard, also the central concept of Kant's critique of judgment, the sensus communis, must be open to criticism. It is not only that his critique is based upon assumptions of a self-evident experience of beauty, it also reveals to be a racial judgment since it assumes that certain persons of non-European descent, such as Iroquois people, are unable to the judgment of taste. Therefore, the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze criticizes the Kantian model as a mode of simple recognition rather than one of a challenge to cognition. He relates this concept to geometrical and agrarian laws of distribution with stereotyped assumptions of sensitive experience. While Kant's call for the recognition of the moral law within is related with Newtonian physics and its deterministic laws of nature, his anthropology as an attempt to find a specifically human nature nevertheless develops a hierarchical assessment of races according to the skin colors placing the whites on top and the blacks or olive yellows at the bottom. As one critique, in this case, Achille Mbembe puts it, aesthetic judgment a la Kant does not reflect itself and its prejudices, but flips over into not wanting to know. Expanding on this, Esse and others underline the fact that all liberal philosophers, such as John Locke, connect the conception of the human individual with bourgeois culture and legitimize the right to vote with property of land. The moral law associated with the domain of freedom reveals itself as reserved to the ratio of possessive capitalism, as Macpherson criticizes. Point two, problematizing the individual. Since Western philosophy is based on the assumption that the human, mainly male agent, has to understand himself as an autonomous individual, my philosophical research is directed at its deconstruction as the responsible person for historical and contemporary acts of cultural discrimination and planetary destruction. The concept of the individual is indicative of the attempt to define a basic and undivided unit within an early physical worldview. Greek atomists formulated the concept atoma as the smallest undivided entity of the universe. The Latin term individuum is the translation of this Greek term by Cicero in the first century CE and initiated a 2,000 year history of philosoph philosophical interpretation of the individual as a substantial and independent entity. It is interesting to learn that contrary to this definition in the history of philosophy, the individual has been unfolded as inner multiplicity and dividedness. For example, Spinoza in his ethic explains, I quote, that the human body requires for his preservation many other bodies by which it is continually regenerated. Its solid, fluid, and gaseous individuals appear to be affected by other bodies and to affect other bodies. End of quote. Spinoza's ethic thus amounts to the call to increase non-individuation and thereby proposes a model directly opposite to the one propagated by liberal philosophers. 
In opposition to Spinoza, in his Treatise of Government, John Locke formulates the first liberal theory of the state in which political power concerns itself exclusively with the preservation of property of the male citizen. And in The Wealth of nat Nation, Adam Smith explicitly declares the individual striving for economic success based on colonization and imperial conquest as beneficial since it increases the wealth of the whole nation. I jump in. In their anti-idealistic text, Die Deutsche Ideologie of 1845, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels put forward that, I quote, under the rule of exchange value, human individu individuation is transformed into de-individuation, subsumed to relations independent of them, end of quote. They stress that consciousness is a social product in the best possible case, understanding the necessity of associating with other individuals. They accuse the bourgeois subject of just seeking their particular interest. Individual forces become private property. Since the workers lose their capacities, they become abstract individuals and should set aside their self-interest and connect with others into a totality of abilities in order to become complete individuals without class. French sociology of the 19th century oscillates between focusing on the single person and on social facts. Gabriel Tart, for example, sees the individuals embedded in trans-individual psychical and physical values. Because human individuals are understood as the crossroads of non-individual affects and ideas, he characterizes them as all-encompassing and generic values, as universal medium, a universe in itself. He anticipates Freud's, Simon Dons, and Deleuze's assumptions on an unconscious, pre-individual, socially embedded single person which is realized according to cultural actualizations. Critiques of the concept of the individual are mainly articulated by post-colonial thinkers such as Stuart Hall, who claims that the Western concept is not corresponding to the hybrid identities of vast parts of the po world's population who are forced to migrate and to adapt to foreign cultures and to become disindividuated in the quest for survival. The philosopher Jacques Nanema of Burkina Faso, for his part, criticizes African disciples for the cult of the European design of the individual, since it is followed only in order to leave behind all constraints of solidarity. The Portuguese sociologist Boaventura de Souza Santos eventually accuses the global north of an epistemicide, a murder of the knowledge, no? of non-Western knowledges and of drawing an abyssal line between zones of being and of non-being until today. He vehemently asked for an aesthetic of the epistemolo epistemologies of the south which not only criticizes the Eurocentric paradigm, but also confronts the continuous neutralization of the struggles of the South. He insists on the necessity of going beyond the North-South dichotomy by developing third values, such as deep entanglements and aesthetic interpenetrations of the violently separated contact zones. Point three, the counter-concept of disindividuation. Today, further insights into single person's voluntary and involuntary participation in biotic masses and ecological ensembles, in world societies and technological practices, all create a need to redefine human subjectivation. <coughs> 
actual insights underline that we have always stood in relationships of interpenetration with languages, images, technologies, social structures, and so forth that question all ideas of indivisibility. We recognize that our understanding as undivided entity expresses a misleading negation of necessary life-constituting participation and find ourselves faced with the task of considering, affirming, and moderating our possibly contradictory participations. We learn to recognize that undividedness is only a question of the scale of observation modes. This is why I propose to substitute the old concept of the individual by the new one of dividuation. Dividuation is intended to put the focus on the processual self-dividuation of the person and of artistic practices, both through participation and subdivisions. These concepts can be understood as the continuation and amalgamation of Gilbert Simondon's term individuation and of Gilles Deleuze's term individual. In Simondon's and Deleuze's philosophy and anthropo anthropogenesis and art practices are conceived as an expanding dynamic of pre-individual and non-personal integrations and difference formations which cannot be called undivided expressions. Therefore, I would like to claim that the inadequate concept of the individual should be replaced by the term dividuation. Dividuation is intended to put the focus on the processual self-dividuation of the person through participation and capture processes. Especially today, under the post-colonial perspective of the increased interferences of cultures in the globalized world, a substitution of the Western concept of the individual seems inevitable. It has to be replaced by a term which does not indicate autonomy, privilege, and epistemological dualism, but instead indicates mobile relationships, forms of participation, or even of mutual constitution of persons, cultures, societies, artworks, ecological assemblages, and so forth. The term individual or individuation is intended to bring to the fore insights into the relatedness of existences with bio and socio-technological with different cultural and aesthetic entities partly constituted by them. The new perspective also raises awareness of economic and digitalized capture and highlights ecological interdependencies. And it fosters an increased awareness of all sorts of participation of their possible tension and on the need to decide on their quantity and quality. It does not want to minimize the personal will reflexivity or capacity of decision-making, but highlights the increased complication due to relationships of all sorts with unknown others. The term individual is used by Gilles Deleuze in different texts with different effective values. In Cinema One, the movement in image from 1986, Deleuze outlines a positive understanding of the individual. Speaking of films, he states that the temporal mobility of audiovisual framings permanently modifies the captured aesthetic ensemble, which therefore cannot be identified as an individual expression. He reads the time-dependent filmic and musical articulations as transitions between varying aesthetic combinations as divisible or indivisible but individual. Understanding, under the sign of increased composite cultural awareness, dividuation is also the result of artistic practices today. In Postscript of Society of Control, Deleuze assigns a historical date to this becoming individual 
equating its emergence with the technology transition from analog to digital, from the disciplinary system to the control system. The society of control imposes unending self-modelings of single persons, therefore Deleuze speaks of new subjectivation modes and new sociological distinctions, I quote, we are no longer dealing with duality of mass and individual. Individuals become individuals and massing, masses become samples, data markets, and so forth. The person appears as a computable information potential whose future development is quantitatively predicted and whose financial profitability estimated. As today's perspective teaches us, contemporary becoming world needs to be understood as an expanded principle of relativity, which does not correspond to atomist or Newton's physics. The principle constrains us to adopt perspectives informed by various lenses. Microscopic observation reveals that living microorganisms contribute to our psychophysical constitution. Recently, we have become aware of how technological devices also condition and help subjectivate us. The technological apparatus coalesces with our neuronal structure and determines the way we manage our time and efforts. On the other hand, it helps us to communicate with other cultures and to appropriate aesthetic items in order to accentuate different heritages also in the artistic practices. In the cultural and aesthetic realm, the philosopher Edouard Glisson has argued for desindividualization already in the 1980s and for the necessary abolishing of unified cultural understandings. Composite culture, the term he coins, does not mean dilution or dispersion of aesthetic science, but their affirmed and not imposed partitions. Very much like the concept of dividuation, Clisson's concept does not mean aesthetic loss of coherence, but translates the conviction that both should de-individualize their form by exposing their cultural multiplicity and political tensions their by subverting their universalized norm and by nevertheless synthesizing their aesthetic heterogeneity into a complex particular expression. Persons as well as artworks should connect with the historically inflicted legacies in terms of indigenous, black, and coloni colonially imposed expressions and should build up complex networks similar to the Caribbean archipelago. By so doing, they should provide a personal and aesthetic model of pluriversality for the whole world Le tout monde, as he likes to state. Several anthropologists and ethnologists of today shared this conviction that cultures of the global south cannot be analyzed within the western frame of nucleus, family, bourgeois society, and the individual. The English ethnologists Merlin Strathern and other anthropologists such as Marshall Salins or Viveros de Castro used the term individual to characterize not only gift economies, but the non-dualistic relationships between persons and their extended families in specific societies of the global south. Extending the term even further, the Indian sociologist Ayun Apadurai refers to the individual in order to, to evoke working class people of the global south and their non-individual struggle for a minoritarian self-determination. Others point at the increasing involvement also of aesthetic languages and their global appropriation, which force us to recognize that there is no longer an autonomous work of art. <coughs> Today, calls for this this othering as method are brought up against the threat of cultural epistemic fixation. The philosopher 
Paula and Haontonji of Benin even asked us to deconstruct the myth of Africanity and to abandon the program of negritude and of all other ethnocentric and separatist ways of conceiving identity. This is why Okui and Weser emphasized the circulation in which African artistic practices are encompassed within their own continent as well as on the global stage. Together with the Congolese philosopher Mudimbe, he seeked seek to con contain the specific tension in the concept of reprendre, which is intended to designate the simultaneous appropriation of African and Western tradition by referencing of post-colonial social context and the resulting formal amalgamation by African art practices. Nicola, today, <laughs> composite cultural positions can be observed in various art practices, such as the stance taken by Ndidi Dike, who wants to perform as an artist from Africa, rather than to suffer the label of an African artist. This is one of her artworks. She combines materials such as rubber, gold, and vanilla to create a complex artwork, thereby formulating an artistic critique of the ruthless politics of extraction by Western powers. In her multimedia installation, Commodities of Consumption and Sites of Extraction, extraction of 2021, she exhibits transparent curtains that reproduce advertisements for vanilla and other colonial products, which are contrasted with reprints of black and white photographs representing black persons, historic scenes of labor, or workers in vanilla fabrics, vanilla factories, but also of the Queen and Westminster Abbey in order to, to evoke the colonial setting. The images are also combined with texts commenting on slavery and the more recent demand for restitution of the Benin bronzes. Ndidi Dike aesthetics, aesthetic statements can be read as paradigmatic for contemporary art practices from the global south. I would assert that they often operate at, as virtuoso examples of dividuation since they placed themselves in relation to Western art languages while adopting and combining them with aesthetic materials of the global south. They accuse the continuous interdependence and the inequality of econ economic and cultural conditions between north and south. In order to conclude, the valorization of the ever-specific individual is associated with a political endeavor to transform our individuatedness into inclusive participation care. It even suggests the putting together of potentials in con-individual ensembles that combat capitalized appropriations and eco-technological over-exploitation. In spite of associated fear of difference loss, one can still assert that every individuation is different from every other, owing to its peculiar participation mode and the way it represents a particular cohesion, which is also true for the cultural and aesthetic sphere. Dividuation, to underline it once again, does not mean uniformization. On the contrary, when the person or the artwork become aware of their multidirectional participations, they recognize themselves as ever particular dividuation whose coherence has to be managed again and again. It remains desirable to accentuate composite cultural differences and to note from which perspective, with what framing, and according to which evaluation a given cultural and aesthetic statement can be recognized as specifically individual and thus different. More than any individual, the individual has to, be, has to decide on his or her particular shape while partially losing control over the interferences with others. 
there are no two identitarian individuals. Recognizing oneself as a individual is a huge task, but it becomes less frightening as we recognize it as a creative work. For individual consciousness ultimately demands that we understand lateral ties as an opportunity for a becoming world through affirmed continuation. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much.